So good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's good to, to have you here. We have with us the um, uh, president, uh, presidents and prime minister of Azerbaijan, of Armenia and Georgia. And um, I didn't know this, but uh, the president of Azerbaijan just uh, told me that this is a historic meeting. This is for the first time um, in history that the three leaders of uh, um, these countries meet. We have to check this in the history book. I know the foreign ministers met, but um, um, Helga Schmidt, the Secretary General of the OSCE, nods, and if she nods, this must be true. So um, um, thank you very much for, for, for joining us here. This conference, um, of course, um, as we all know, is uh, happening one year um, after um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and this um, uh, conference continues like last year to have this as a main topic. Now, um, your countries are um, not directly involved, but you are um, neighbors um, to, to Russia. And my first question is, um, how has um, Russia's invasion, the war against Ukraine, how has this affected your respective uh, uh, countries? Um, President Aliyev, if I may ask you. Well, I would say that uh, there was not a direct impact on us, but definitely the general geopolitical situation has changed completely and probably will not uh, go back to the time before Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, so uh, we can see some uh, disadvantages uh, with respect to uh, trade cooperation with some traditional partners. At the same time, some advantages, especially with respect to connectivity projects. Azerbaijan for many years invested in creation of modern transportation and logistical infrastructure. And now um, the diversion of cargo transportation from Central Asia uh, across Azerbaijan to Europe uh, creates additional opportunities. But uh, you know that we had our own war uh, something more than two years ago, uh, which lasted uh, for 44 days. And we know what is war. We know uh, what kind of uh, devastation and uh, suffering it brings to the peoples. Therefore, we, uh, of course, uh, want peace to be established in Eurasia. And I think that uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia need to demonstrate that the transition from a long-lasting standoff, uh, mutual hatred and hostility must end. Uh, we are now working on peace agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Hopefully, we will conclude it sooner than later. And I think that could be a good example how countries which had uh, serious uh, historical uh, disagreements uh, can get together and turn the page of hostility. Uh, so that would be my answer. Thank you very much. And before I ask uh, uh, the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Armenia to respond to this, I would uh, pass through Georgia, um, Georgia, um, of course, has um, these occupied territories, um, Abkhazia, uh, South Ossetia, and um, what is the effect now for, um, for your country uh, from the side of Russia? Um, are there still, how about the Geneva talks? Um, um, is there anything happening? How, is, how has this impacted you? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for organizing this panel discussion. I think this is a very good initiative and historic meeting, as you mentioned, when the three leaders of the South Caucasus get together. And, and I think this is a great, already successful uh, meeting. And thank you for uh, organizing this uh, discussion. Uh, when it comes to the war in Ukraine, of course, this is a big challenge for all of us. Since World War II, I think Europe and the world in general, has not experienced such a big challenge. You know that to, uh, in 2008 we had a war with Russia, and since then uh, Russia occupies 
our historic territories, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, Russia has uh, two military bases on our territory. And since then, we have been facing lots of problems, challenges. But after we, we came to power in 2012, we have made lots of efforts in order to de-escalate the tension. De-escalate tension, and at the same time, of course, we have been uh, very active on our European integration path. Georgia signed uh, association agreement, uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union. We got the visa-free regime, and last year this was a historic decision when the European Council de decided to give us uh, European perspective. So to respond to your question, how the war in Ukraine affects all of us and Georgia, right now we all see that Russia is focused on Ukraine. It's a devastating war, and I have to say that we must do everything in order to stop this war. There is no alternative to peace, and um, I have to tell you that um, Georgia has been pursuing a peaceful resolution policy when it comes to the restoration of sovereignty and territorial integrity of our country. We have made it very clear that Georgia has a peaceful plan to restore its territorial integrity. I want to thank the OSCE, EU, US, um, and other participants who have been actively involved in the mediation process. You mentioned Mr. Hoisgen, uh, Geneva international discussion. This is the only platform that we have right now with the Russians. And um, so therefore, I must repeat again that this war must be stopped. We have seen this war and the effects of this war in our country in 2008. And lots of, a lot of people died and we lost control on our territories completely. And as I said, Russia has military bases on our territory, and it's ongoing, it's, it doesn't stop. I also want to mention that um, <clears throat> since 2008 war, we haven't seen any sanctions that were imposed on Russia. On the contrary, we saw that business continued as usual. Therefore, it was a very, let's say, bad signal. To conclude, I think uh, the international community now must uh, decide how we, move, how we move forward, because if this war continues, it means uh, more devastation, uh, more killings of civilians. So therefore, once again, I want to repeat that our intention, our, I mean, let's say, goal has to be to stop this war. Yes, um, I think you are absolutely right. This, the, the, the killing has to stop. Um, but let me just briefly come back to your, to your country. You mentioned 2008, and uh, um, I was at the time uh, advisor to the, to the chancellor, and um, it was a, a very, very difficult situation where we don't have to go into detail. But um, going back to 2008, may I ask you, at that time, we, had, um, we dealt with President Saakashvili, and um, we have seen alarming pictures, photos of President Saakashvili in, in a very um, uh, delicate situation, and um, people are afraid for his life, and there's also a journalist um, who is in a different situation. I have the impression in your country that what is called in times of, uh, in harsh times, in times where you have a war in the region, uh, that it calls for a national unity, and uh, is this something, uh, there is something where from the outside one has doubts that this is happening in, in your country, and uh, um, as I said, President Saakashvili was a host, uh, was a guest very often here at the Munich Security Conference, and as I said, this alarming pictures there, isn't, isn't there not a possibility so that he can get out and get some uh, treatment in, in, in hospitals um, outside Georgia? Well, first of all, thank you for this question. I don't want to talk about and speculate about the health of uh, President Saakashvili, who is now in a private hospital. I want the people to know that he arrived in Georgia, he came back in Georgia two years ago, actually more than a year and a half ago, October 1st, to be more precise. The idea of his comeback was to make another revolution in Georgia, to organize mass killings and bloodshed, 
he failed and he ended up in jail. So he requested that we transfer him in private hospital. I don't want to bother the audience about the details, but since you asked this publicly, I have to respond. So he has been in the private hospital for more than eight months, and the Georgian government has been providing maximum support, maximum comfort, all the privileges that other prisoners are not receiving. Uh, you mentioned the pictures and photos. I want to say that uh, Mr. Sakash is a good actor. Georgian government has, has been doing everything we can, the maximum support, again, I want to repeat. We even made uh, uh, proposal or offer to his family to bring any doctors from any hospital or, or from any country to provide medical, in case he needs medical support uh, in Georgia. So this is my answer. And I also want to mention that um, uh, probably you have I've seen uh, lots of uh, fake news disinformation that has been uh, spreading by the uh, lobbying firms of Mr. Saakashvili and his family. Uh, for example, I want to give you just a fact. Last month it was uh, disclosed that his family officially paid $1 million uh, to launch an aggressive media campaign all around the world. So what you hear, what you see on the videos or uh, on Facebook or social network does not actually describe the reality. So therefore, uh, no one stands above the, law, above the law. We are building a strong democracy in Georgia. We are building, strengthening democratic institutions. This is the understanding of, uh, of democracy, I guess, that no one should be above the law. Saakashvili committed uh, grave crimes, such as the killings of uh, former banker, Gir Guliani, this was a famous case, uh, beating up to death uh, former member of parliament, uh, and uh, many other cases, seizure of uh, private TV channel Imedi, for example. Plus, he added another crime, which is the crossing illegally state border. Uh, by the way, for your information, he spent uh, two days in a container, truck, refrigerator, when to get a ferry boat from Ukraine, from Odessa, to come back to Georgia to do revolution. So this is the story. I didn't want to talk about this uh, individual uh, here at this panel to bother you all the details, but since you asked, Mr. Mr. Hoisgen, I want to respond about this. Yeah. I Thank don't you. want to deepen into it, just a humanitarian appeal I would like to, to launch there. Um, Prime Minister Pashinyan, um, coming back to the question I asked at the, at the outside also to um, uh, President Aliyev, the repercussions of uh, um, the war of Russia against Ukraine on, on your country. Thank you. Uh, uh, I also would like to express my gratitude to you and for organizing such a format. And um, uh, really, um, um, I agree, maybe uh, it is historic uh, meeting, uh, but it's very important to identify the content of the history that now is being created because we can have a different, um, a different uh, outcome, consequences or results and I think we need to be result oriented and that is uh, our approach. And as far as your question is concerned, you know uh, global instability um, uh, can make um, things uh, in our region better uh, because, you know, um, uh, for a long time, all international attention is concentrated uh, on Ukraine, understandably, and uh, it creates uh, new risks uh, for our region. And it's very important to, to, uh, to keep um, uh, the international uh, attention uh, to our uh, region as well, because uh, I, think, uh, I think there are many risks uh, to be managed. What is our approach to this whole situation? Uh, uh, we um, uh, stayed uh, devoted to our democratic reform agenda because we believe that uh, democratic reforms 
the uh, development of democratic institutions, rule of law, human rights, um, independent judiciary, etc., uh, would make uh, would make uh, the uh, overall situation in our region better, and uh, uh, we think that it is a benefit for whole region for us to uh, do a part of uh, the, uh, the our part of the job. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this leads me now directly to the Secretary General of uh, the OSCE, Helga Schmidt. Uh, wonderful to uh, be here in your in your hometown in in Munich. Now the um, OSCE is um, the, uh, an organization where the three countries are member of. By the way, an organization where Russia is still member of. What can the OSCE? at this stage do to help also um, um, cooperation between the countries to help to stabilize, to have the instruments that the OSC has at its disposal at a different, at a difficult time for your organization, but what can you do to, um, to try to um, um, lower tensions and, and promote cooperation? Yeah, thank you. And, uh I'm also very happy to be part of this, this uh, uh, meeting today, but I would, uh, before I come uh, uh, to your question, Christoph, let me just say that um, uh, we are also witnessing the impact of a horrible earthquake that is affecting Turkey and Syria, and I actually would like to start by paying tribute to all three of you, because you have uh, been providing life-saving, very quick support. And I know, um, particularly I want to pay tribute to you, Prime Minister Pashin, and I know your Foreign Minister uh, was in uh, Turkey, I think only a couple of days ago, meeting with his uh, uh, Turkish counterpart. And in the face of this tragedy, uh, we actually may find a way uh, to, to work together. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I think this is, this is very important. But now, the, um, uh, there may be no maybe direct impact, as you said, uh, President, uh, when it comes to the, the war against Ukraine. But we know for sure is that there is really a very strong feeling of uh, insecurity in the wider Black Sea uh, region. And, uh, and I think the, the only way forward is really keeping the processes, I agree with you, uh, on the Geneva International Discussions, uh, dialogues, but also regional cooperation. The OEC, and this brings me to your question, has a mandate uh, to promote regional uh, cooperation, also to promote uh, trade links, uh, connectivity. I think that's uh, uh, very important. Now, it's very difficult uh, to build uh, sustainable peace, uh, reconciliation. There are outstanding issues that need to be addressed uh, related to the border, missing people, detainees, uh, also mines. So this is why it's, 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 it's very important to use all uh, the, the means we have, also on confidence building measures, for example, um, uh, uh, regional hum uh, humanitarian demining efforts could be envisaged. We work a lot already with youth. Youth are the stakeholders of tomorrow to bring together the leaders of tomorrow uh, with all, all three countries. You will not be surprised to hear me say that women have to be uh, part of all of that. But um, uh, regional cooperation is important. I also am very supportive of the Brussels-led dialogue, I think because it can deliver very concrete results and also the, the implementation of the, the roadmaps agreed. In the end, it's about people. It's about conflict-affected people that deserve uh, a better life for the future. Mm. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Helga, you mentioned um, also, uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan, that you are helping um, in Turkey also now um, in, in the face of this horrible uh, earthquake. Do you see a perspective that between Armenia and Turkey, um, what we have been uh, um, looking for over many, many years, decades, that there is um, um, actually an improvement of, of relations. Um, you know, at some stage we were close to again, you know, getting rid of the blockade and where, where do you stand there? Is there a perspective that out of this horrible crisis, um, um, this catastrophe, humanitarian catastrophe, something good may come out in your relationship? Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, um, 
uh, deciding to, to send uh, humanitarian um, aid and uh, um, rescuers to Turkey, uh, we had um, uh, humanitarian motivations only uh, because, uh, because um, millions of people uh, suffered uh, uh, next to us. And, uh, but uh, in the process, we see uh, a quite positive reaction from the Turkish government. And if this step uh, will have uh, political results uh, as well, it's better. But our initial motivation, purely humanitarian, and uh, as, uh, as we um, announced, uh, we are ready to provide as, uh, mm, as many uh, humanitarian support as it, it is in our uh, capacities, and we are ready to do that. As uh, far as political dialogue is concerned, to be honest, uh, the, before the earthquake, uh, we, we had uh, political di di dialogue through the special envoys. And I believe that uh, uh, in reality, uh, this uh, dialogue uh, uh, was very important. Uh, I mean, in the creating atmosphere where, where these decisions were made. And I believe that uh, um, uh, uh, through this humanitarian uh, um, uh, conversation and communication, maybe, maybe the opportunities for concrete uh, political uh, decisions uh, will, uh, will be higher. Especially, Minister, uh, yeah, you uh, mentioned visited Turkey uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, some, uh, some um, political uh, arrangement were mentioned there and we are ready to go forward because we believe that really uh, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, establishment of diplomatic uh, uh, relations with Turkey and the opening of our border uh, would, uh, would be very positive, not only in terms of the, our regional situation, but uh, for international situation as well. Yeah, and let's hope that this comes out. We had originally, um, the Turkish Foreign Minister, Chavez Shoglu, wanted to come here, but um, of course, uh, due to the situation in, um, in the country, he had to stay, stay home. But um, let's hope that this will lead to something, because um, this, was, this, cor this border was closed for far too long, and we have to come also to improvement for the um, relations there. Um, now, let me come to the elephant in the room, if you um, allow me. This is, of course, the, the question that President Aliyev um, um, alluded to at the very beginning, the um, war um, that started, is it two years ago already? And um, we see um, um, a, a, a situation which is um, still very critical. Um, we are not here to do any negotiations, on it. but um, of course we are, um, when you look at it, the outside, the international community, we are concerned about the um, uh, humanitarian situation and um, one looks always, as we have been looking right now with regard to humanitarian aid to Turkey, we are looking at humanitarian steps, we see the Lachin corridor that is um, seen from the outside blocked and uh, we, we um, wonder, and, and maybe, um, uh, Prime Minister, you can tell us a bit about um, maybe efforts to have some confidence building um, measures there to see that somehow the situation uh, improves. And um, um, we would, of course, all, and afterwards I would like to turn to President Aliyev again, we would, of course, like to see that through some small steps we come to a um, de escalation and come closer to a resolution of this conflict. Thank you. Uh, uh, you're right. Uh, it's already uh, uh, seven, 70 days that the Lachin Corridor is blocked and uh, now unfortunately we have a humanitarian crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, uh, energetic uh, crisis as well. Uh, because uh, because uh, electricity, electricity supplies uh, 
to Nagorno Karabakh uh, have been uh, shut down and uh, the gas supplies as well uh, have been shut down and we uh, we counted and during the uh, last 70 days the gas supplies uh, were cut uh, at least 10 times uh, and it is the uh, uh, problem that should be addressed and uh, our position is that uh, uh, in the trilateral uh, statement from the 9 November 2020 we have uh, very uh, precise provisions connected with uh, Laching Corridor and uh, according to that uh, statement uh, it is the uh, obligation of the uh, Azerbaijan and uh, uh, Russian peacekeepers to, uh, to keep uh, uh, Laching Corridor operable but now unfortunately we have a uh, totally different situation and uh, uh, I meant uh, Lachin Corridor as well, saying that international uh, attention should be kept on this situation because we are afraid that continuation of, uh, of uh, this situation uh, can cause uh, unturnable uh, humanitarian uh, consequences for Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. President um, Aliyev, as I said, I, we are not here. We cannot negotiate the, um, um, the substance of the agreement and how to come to a final conclusion. I think uh, um, the President of the European Council has been working with you on this. We don't want to get into this. My question is just, um, um, is there, do you see, because you are saying that we should use this um, opportunity uh, now um, to come to a more stable uh, situation. Um, can you do some humanitarian gestures so that this blockade is, is being stopped um, and uh, the people that, um, um, according to what the Prime Minister is just saying, are in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, are living in very difficult circumstances. Is there something um, you can do as kind of a goodwill measure, confidence building, so that talks have um, a chance to, to succeed in the, the, the uh, um, you know, with regard to the more substantial questions that, of course, um, um, are not resolved yet? As far as uh, we understand and uh, in our communications with uh, our American partners and uh, partners from the uh, European Union and also as far as I understood from today's uh, trilateral meeting uh, with Prime Minister Pashinyan which was organized by Secretary Blinken, we have a common understanding that there should be a two-track approach to the situation in the region. First, Azerbaijan Armenian peace talks track. Second, uh, Azerbaijan's uh, communications with uh, Armenian population in Karabakh. Just for your information, the word Nagorno-Karabakh is no longer valid. This is actually the Russian word. Nagorno means mountainous. And in Azerbaijan, there is not such an administrative unit like Nagorno-Karabakh. Therefore, of course, I would like to ask our partners to respect the sovereignty and constitution of Azerbaijan. There is a Karabakh region of Azerbaijan where there is an Armenian uh, population. Uh, so this two-track solution actually separates our talks with Armenia from our internal issues like our communications with uh, Armenians in Karabakh. And also it was agreed with our international partners that there'll be uh, discussions on rights and securities of uh, Armenian minority in Karabakh. And we are ready to do it, but with uh, uh, those representatives of Armenian community who lived, who were born, and who lived uh, in Karabakh throughout their life, but not with a person who was uh, exported from Russia uh, to have the leading position in Karabakh. Maybe exported is not the right word. I would probably prefer the word smuggle into because nobody knows how he 
emerged in Karabakh and how he is trying and achieving to go back to Yerevan and from there to Moscow and then back to Yerevan and then to Karabakh. The only this fact demonstrates that there is no blockade. Uh, second fact which demonstrates that there is no blockade is that since 12th December until today, uh, when our uh, activists from civil society came to the checkpoint, there have been more than 2,500 vehicles, including trucks of Russian peacekeepers and the representatives of Red Cross. Almost 100 medical patients from Karabakh were taken by Red Cross to Armenia for treatment. So how can we call it a blockade when there is a open road and uh, if uh, Armenians in Karabakh try to use this road, I'm sure no one uh, will stop them. So this is important to uh, understand the uh, current situation. And also in order to properly evaluate the uh, current situation, we need to go back a little bit to the history. For almost 30 years, our lands were under Armenian occupation. Prime Minister Garibashvili uh, mentioned that in 2008, after the Russian-Georgian War, there were no sanctions imposed on Russia. But I also can say that Armenia occupied 20% of Azerbaijan's territory, violated international law, did not comply with UN Security Council resolutions for 27 years, and no sanctions were imposed on them. And we always were asking for sanctions to Armenia to be imposed to avoid the war. We were waiting for Minsk Group to deliver result. We were waiting for uh, Security Council of United Nations to respect their resolutions. But we thought that there is no movement and there is a common understanding that this conflict is frozen. So we proved that it is not frozen. We had to fight, we have to sacrifice 3,000 lives in order to restore our dignity, our territorial integrity and justice and implement UN Security Council resolutions. Therefore, we cannot take out of the context today's situation in Karabakh or our uh, communications with the Armenian community there and just forget about uh, 30 years of occupation, forget about that the territory equal to the territory of Lebanon is totally in ruins. And that was done not by aliens, that was done by our neighbors who came, occupied our land, made a million Azerbaijanis homeless, destroyed 65 out of 67 mosques, desecrated them. And then when we kick them out, they now plead for justice. They occup uh, accuse us of occupation, those who occupied us for 30 years. And also one thing is also uh, should not be forgotten that the trilateral declaration of November 2020, which uh, Prime Minister referred to, actually de facto, is a capitulation act by Armenia. We fought the war, and the results of the war have been uh, accepted by international community and by Armenian society. And the best indicator to that was a new mandate which Armenian population gave to Prime Minister. And that was a mandate for peace. Therefore, we need to look to the future. And I think that if we look to the future, and today is, uh, as we discussed just prior to the session, is a historical day because for the first time free leaders get together in the independent countries. There was cases like that during the Soviet times. And we should not miss this opportunity. Karabakh Armenians are Azerbaijani citizens, a minority. Azerbaijan is multi-ethnic country and all minorities in Azerbaijan enjoy same rights and privileges, including cultural, linguistical, and uh, any other, and also security. And we're ready to start practical uh, communications with uh, representatives of Armenian community in Karabakh. And today, in front of Secretary Blinken, I told uh, my Armenian colleague about that, but we can do it only when Russian citizen, uh, criminal oligarch, uh, person who was involved in money laundering in Europe, Vardanyan, is out of our territory. 
No, we, as I said, we cannot replace negotiations here, but I would like to give the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Pashinyan, a, 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 a possibility to react to what he heard from uh, uh, President uh, Aliyev. Um, and then also I would like to give uh, the audience, uh, of course, a chance to, to ask questions uh, um, and to the, to the panelists. Um, Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, about Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, you know, uh, uh, President mentioned uh, trilateral statement, and on that trilateral statement we have provision, and we have Nagorno-Karabakh on trilateral statement, and the, we have signature of the President of Azerbaijan under this document and we have latching corridor that uh, should be uh, freely operable and by the way according to that uh, trilateral statement out of control of Azerbaijan and it is according to the signature of president of uh, Azerbaijan and recently you know some um, uh, Armenians uh, uh, children from Nagorno-Karabakh they uh, tried to travel by bus uh, through Lachin Corridor and they were stopped and masked uh, uh, some uh, uh, Azerbaijani persons with masks uh, intruded into bus and uh, uh, children there were screaming uh, and, uh, and uh, that was the last attempt of uh, the uh, Armenians on Nagorno-Karabakh to uh, free me, freely uh, commute through uh, Lachin Corridor. President Aliyev mentioned uh, destroyed mosques. You know, uh, I would like to say that in 2017, in Azerbaijan, several mosques were destroyed for, for building new roads. And President Aliyev mentioned that uh, several, I, I don't know how many thousand mosques uh, that uh, were destroyed. And by the way, in the Soviet time, in the Soviet time, and uh, when uh, uh, in Azerbaijan, approximately 1,000 560 mosques were destroyed. And that usual, it, it was the usual thing for Soviet Union. In Armenian, Soviet, uh, Soviet, uh, in Soviet time, churches uh, were destroyed, mosques were destroyed. And you know, I, 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 uh, uh, Armenians of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, they don't, they shouldn't pay uh, the debts from the Soviet time. And you know, it's very important, uh, it's very important. It is very dangerous uh, 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 narrative because I'm afraid uh, um, uh, sometime uh, there is an impression that Azerbaijan want to, uh, to give some religious context to this whole situation. It is very dangerous. There is no any religious context in the, uh, in the conflict. And the proof is that, uh, that we have uh, very good, uh, and by the way, in our country, we have a Muslim minority. And we have, uh, in our country, um, uh, um, acting mosque, and, uh, and uh, uh, that is the re reality. And you know the, the wording of Azerbaijan, you, what is concerning? Uh, using the wording of, of, of uh, uh, such, uh, such kind of uh, um, uh, almost offensive wording, capitulation, etc. You know, from a side, it can be impression that now Azerbaijan want to, uh, to uh, uh, to show uh, that, and uh, that is uh, maybe reality, that Azerbaijan adopted a revenge policy. You know, revenge policy, and maybe, uh, maybe uh, that is the policy of Azerbaijan. 
but as, uh, as uh, it was mentioned, we have very complicated history. And I, I just said, yes, maybe it is historical meeting, but for what purpose we want to use this? For inflaming intolerance, hate, aggressive rhetorics in our region, or in opposite, we want to use this platform for make, making things better. We think that this platform vote to be used for constructive purposes. Of course, we can now tell many stories of enmity, but what is the meaning of our leadership? To deepen that enmity or to use our capacities, our authorities, our mandates. I'm proud that I, I, I've, I've been able, our government was able, even after the devastating war, to have free democratic elections in our country that was worldwide acknowledged as free, democratic, and, uh, and, and, uh, and transparent, and competitive. And as I said, from our point of view, is uh, the, the solution is democracy, the solution is transparency, the solution is dialogue, the solution is respect for, uh, uh, for all countries in our region. And we are ready to, to work to that di direction. Thank you. No, thank you very much. We will not be able to go any deeper into this. Again, my appeal is what I said at the beginning, that maybe this will help a bit um, to have some um, confidence building measures to see to it that when the Latin corridor is used by children um, um, by um, to get humanitarian aid to get um, you know have people travel there that this is possible so that people don't have to to suffer from the political differences that that subsist there also that they have um, access to to energy um, so this is only the the appeal we can launch here from this from this podium. Now we have a few minutes left, and um, I would ask uh, uh, questions. There, um, this is a topic where you can have um, not ask question but give a long statement. Um, so I um, just warn, please, only short questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I'm Yulia Smolovskaya, Globsec Kiev office. Um, my question I'd like to put uh, with regard to one common denominator that would probably uh, would be much easier for the president and two prime ministers to answer with regard to Russia. So basically, have the situation, uh, the war in Ukraine, which was unexpected to most of us, forced you to reconsider your perception of Russia, because right now it is saying that Russia has turned itself from the point of stability into the country of instability in terms of security. So in this case, I see a bit of developments on all the sides with all the countries. So the question to the Prime Minister of Armenia is, uh, you mentioned a couple of times that collective treaty, uh, a security defense uh, treaty organization is not very productive at the moment and, and raised this issue that you might be, Armenia might be leaving it. So could you dwell a bit more on these prospects? Uh, then for the um, uh, Prime Minister of Georgia, we reassessed uh, the calculations about the Post potential uh, strategic moves of Russia. While they are losing in Ukraine, they might be considering of uh, making some blitzkriegs in the countries they consider much more vulnerable and easy targets like Moldova and Georgia. 
Do you see this threat for your country and for uh, the uh, uh, president of Azerbaijan? Um, you mentioned these negotiations and talks with the participation of U.S. as mediator. So it looks like Russia has lost this role with regard to Nagorno-Karabakh. Could you comment on that, please? Thank you. I mean, these are, these are very good questions, but this is very unfair because by having three people there is so, uh, but uh, since you're from a partner organization, um, <laughs> um, uh, well, what choice do I have? Um, Prime Minister. Well, um, well uh, you know, and uh, it was public and transparent, uh, we have uh, some concerns connected uh, with the CSTO and we raised uh, those issues with our partners uh, and uh, actually uh, we made it public and we are working uh, and uh, the concerns are there uh, in the place and we are working to, to, to address all the issues that and all the questions and concerns that we have. Thank you for the question. You mentioned about the threats that are coming from Russia. Um, well, first of all, I have to say that, you know, talking to our European friends, American friends, our international partners, uh, everybody has the same position that we're not in a position now to say something more precisely concretely, right, what will happen in Ukraine. Of course, the consequences, the result of this war will have impact on countries like Georgia, you mentioned Moldova. Let's say, let's be very frank, on the entire European security architecture, on the world. Because was what uh, Russia is trying to do now is they're trying to change the international order, rules-based international order. So I think what the experts have been saying uh, to us, within two, three months, we will have a, a clearer picture about where we are. So uh, you know about Georgia. Georgia is uh, partially occupied. 20% of our territory is occupied by Russia. We experienced this war in 2008. We had uh, indirect, let's say so, uh, war in, in the beginning of the 90s when the separatists in Abkhazia and Ossetia were backed by the uh, Russians. So we have a good experience. So therefore, it's really hard to say what will happen. I think time will show us where we are now, where will be the world, the region, uh, and Europe after Ukraine. So, but I, 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 have to, I have to repeat what I said in, the, in my opening remarks. There is no alternative to the peaceful negotiation and peaceful talks because we have uh, witness that uh, uh, nuclear war rhetoric has, has come back, which is catastrophic for the entire world, not only for Ukraine and for Europe, but for the entire planet, right? So therefore, we must expect that big players such as United States, uh, China, Russia, European Union, will sit down and talk about the future of this planet. Because once again, the war is not a solution. Georgia is a small country with only 4 million population. Again, with our own uh, challenges. But uh, what we have managed to achieve in the last decade, this is the only peaceful period, this 10-year period, when we have been in power. We ensured peace and stability. This is what people need. We need pe uh, peace, stability, and prosperity. So. By war, we cannot achieve prosperity, we cannot achieve stability. Thank you. And President Aliyev. We have uh, several uh, platforms to address the issues related to normalization of Azerbaijan-Armenian relationship. One of them is so-called Brussels format. And yesterday, during the meeting with the President of European Council, Mr. Charles Michel, we once again uh, reconfirmed our commitment to the Brussels process. Today, during the uh, trilateral meeting uh, hosted by Secretary Blinken, we also discussed uh, also Brussels process as a trilateral format. And I think there is a common understanding that this is only trilateral. 
EU, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. There is certain legacy from the so-called former Minsk group, which uh, already retired and actually do not exist, maybe exist only on the paper. Therefore, the former co-chairs of the Minsk group, uh, which actually did not deliver any result for uh, 28 years, uh, they still have some uh, leverage on the situation. Therefore, we have a platform which is hosted by United States, by Russia, and now by uh, European Union, but no longer by France, because of one-sided uh, pro-Armenian position of the French government. And it is clear that when you are mediator, you cannot take sides and you cannot demonstrate that you uh, take sides. So this, I think, is the answer to your question. And uh, above um, of that, I want to say that whoever will help both countries to come to an agreement, of course, will uh, have the champion's uh, medal. But with respect to the um, peace talks, you know, we can understand this position. But uh, judging from our experience, I can tell you that peace talks sometimes last too long. We had peace talks for 28 years. Can you imagine, from 1992 until 2020? And if we did not uh, resolve Karabakh conflict on the battlefield, these peace talks would have continued for 28 years more. It was absolutely acceptable to Armenia because they wanted to seal the situation, to keep our lands under occupation forever. It was acceptable for Armenian friends in different parts of the world, but it was not acceptable to us, and we were preparing. We were mobilizing our efforts. We were growing new generation, growing new generation which came and liberated the lands which they have never seen uh, because they were young, and they were not even born when uh, Armenia occupied our lands. Therefore, peace talks, yes, I am not against, but you have to restore justice by force, and this is your legitimate right. This is right given to you by Chapter 51 of uh, United Nations, and we use that right, and we fought on our territory. Our war was war of uh, liberation, and that's why it was a just war. Our war was not a war of occupation, and that's why we didn't have a single one from our army who left the battlefield for 44 days when our cities and villages were shelled by Iskander uh, missiles, no one left the battlefield. In Armenia, there have been 11,000 deserters. Why? Not because they were losing on the battlefield, because their war was occupational war. There was no motivation for people who were born in Armenia to go to Azerbaijan and to fight for the land which do not belong to them. And what we've seen uh, as one of the results of our liberation war, the main factor is motivation. Weapons, important. Tactics, important. Planning, very important. But motivation is number one. And you cannot uh, conquer the people who want liberty. They can wait. They can wait like we waited for 28 years. But one day they come to their land, they kick out the aggressor, and they put the flag on top of all our historical buildings. Well, thank you very much for participating in this forum. Um, we did not have, of course, the expectation that uh, we would uh, solve the issues um, that um, are unresolved until now. My appeal again to all of you, to all three of you, to look at humanitarian gestures that you can do um, to um, um, improve the, the situation of people independent then of, um, with regard to Armenia and Azerbaijan of these talks. And I hope that these talks under the auspices of the European Union will, will yield a, a lasting success. And then I propose that um, in a year from now we meet here again and see where we stand. So thank you very much for participating and thank you very much uh, Helga, for continuing to work on the one way forward, confidence building measures, OSCE measures where you can work together. So thank you very much.